This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. All around the world, people tell stories about the moon and its power over human behavior. From tales of goddesses and gods, to folk wisdom about fertility and farming, to legends about monsters. The full moon is especially important and symbolic. In stories, it's when werewolves transform and people behave more strangely. Our connection with the moon isn't the type of thing you might think of investigating scientifically. But on today's episode, we'll talk with a scientist whose research shows that the moon has a powerful and scientifically quantifiable impact on one of the defining traits of human life. Sleep is so fundamental to our existence as humans that we spend a third of our lives doing it. And researchers are still working to find out why. Yeah, okay. That, okay. So my name is Horacio de la Iglesia, and I'm a professor at the Department of Biology at the University of Washington. Dr. de la Iglesia is a Leakey Foundation grantee and a neurobiologist who studies circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are a kind of internal clock we all have a clock that drives and regulates the processes in our bodies that run on a rhythmic cycle. And we have a lot of those. The menstrual cycle, body temperature cycles. And the best example is the sleep-wake cycle, this alternation that we have between consciousness and and unconsciousness uh, is driven by a biological clock that tells your brain this is a good time to be sleeping and this is not a good time to be sleeping and you should be awake. Sleep is a strange behavior if you think about it. For humans, every 24 hours or so, our internal clock goes off and we slip into unconsciousness for about eight hours. We mostly just lie there and we have very little awareness of our surroundings and very limited response to outside stimulus. We typically do it at night and we do it from before we're born until the day we die. The functions of sleep are still an unsolved mystery. Why do we need to sleep a third of our whole life, right? Eight hours a day we spend in this state that is, you know, very underwhelming from a behavioral point of view, right? Because you're not doing anything. You're not interacting with the world. And your impact from the world and in the world depends on essentially what you do while you're awake, right? But regardless of whether we ever find what is the ultimate function of sleep, we know that it's a necessary trait for life. Before we had electricity, and even before we had fire, it's believed that our forebears naturally timed their sleep with the sun, waking with the sunrise and sleeping after dusk when it got too dark to see. Horacio wants to test this hypothesis. He wants to understand what sleep was like for humans throughout our evolution, how electric light has changed the ancestral pattern of sleep, and how our circadian rhythms relate to the rhythms of the natural world, to the sun and the moon and the seasons. Yeah, so, you know, I've been studying circadian rhythms and sleep for maybe 30 years since I was an undergrad in Argentina. The the interest actually started about 20-something years ago. I was sitting at a conference, and I heard a psychiatrist talking about the effect of artificial light on our circadian rhythms and hormonal rhythms. In his lab, this psychiatrist, his name is Thomas Ware, have been putting people under different experimental cycles of artificial light to see how their bodies responded and how their sleep changed. And it turned out that the response to artificial light was dramatic. The people in the experiment who were exposed to less artificial light slept more, their sleep divided into two shorter periods of sleep instead of one long one, and their release of melatonin, the sleep hormone, changed too. And I was like, wow, that's amazing that you know, our artificial lead environment can have such a dramatic impact in in our daily physiology. I remember I was sitting next to Diego Golombek, who's one of the collaborators in some of these studies. And I said, we should look for communities in Argentina, uh, because, you know, we're both originally from Argentina, that may still not have access to electricity and see whether we can try to get a sense of what this pristine sleep was like before we introduce all this uh, artificial lighting in the environment. Several years after having that idea, he was talking with a colleague who works with indigenous people known as the Toba, or Quam, in Argentina. He asked her if she knew of any communities that still have no access to electricity. 
And she said, uh, yeah, actually, if you go west, you know, and you drive for like three hours in a four-wheel drive truck and do this, this, and that, you will get to communities that have um, still very different levels of urbanization. And, and that's how it started. Happily for Horacio and his project collaborators, people in the Tobaquam communities were interested in participating in the sleep research. The Tobaquam uh, ethnic group is an indigenous South American group from northern Argentina and southern Paraguay. They originally lived in, in the areas that are on the border between Argentina and Paraguay. The, it's an independent group from the Incas and the Guaranis, the largest, the larger groups that we know from South America. One thing that's unique about the Tobaquam is that there are several communities that live within a short distance of each other, but they have very different lifestyles. Horacio looked at three of these communities. One lives on the outskirts of a large town. They have 24-7 access to electricity. They have street lights paved roads, and they can go to stores. So they are, you know, not highly urbanized, but it's an urban environment. Another group is more rural. They might have maybe a few light sources in their home, but they don't have a lot of electric light, and they don't have street lights. And then there's a third community that lives in a remote area without any access to electricity. This, over the years, has become an, an, an amazing uh, system, right, to study the influence of urbanization, but particularly of the access to electricity, because throughout the years we have shown that what matters, it's really electric light. Um, you know, of all the things that urbanization gives you access to, electric light is probably the one that has highest impact. These different levels of urbanization make for a perfect control group to study something like sleep. There are lots of communities in the world without electricity. That's not too hard to find. But what's really hard to find are control communities that belong to the same ethnic group, the same historical background, the same social cultural background, and that you can study them in parallel, right? And in that sense, this has become a, a beautiful, if you want, natural experiment, right? Where we have communities that are very, very homogeneous, but they only differ in their level of, of urbanization. So with this ideal setup for learning about sleep and natural conditions, Horacio and his colleagues got to work, tracking people's sleep, taking saliva samples to measure melatonin levels, and interviewing study participants. And within a few years, they published their first paper showing the impact of electric light on sleep. That, that study showed that the communities that live without access to electricity go to bed earlier and sleep longer on a daily basis than the communities that do have access to electricity. As they were doing this work, they stumbled on a new mystery to investigate. As Horacio and his collaborator Leandro Casaragi interviewed study participants in the three communities, an interesting pattern emerged in the stories they were hearing. It had to do with the moon. It was very clear that there was activity associated with moonlit nights, right? So they would say, oh, on the nights that there's moonlight, uh, we go to the river and fish, or we go hunting, or we go, you know, swimming in the river, or the elderly, uh, at least the, the men would tell you that they were, when they were young, they would have more sexual encounters on moonlit nights, and there was all this anecdotal evidence for activity that took place during moonlit nights that we said, well, you know, maybe this is quantifiable, so why don't we try to measure this and also see where that nocturnal activity during moonlit nights is associated also with inhibited sleep. That's how the project started. The anecdotes about activity on moonlit nights made Horacio and Leandro curious to see if they could find and measure some connection between sleep and moonlight. To see if our natural biological clocks are influenced by the moon in any way. A lot of scientists say the moon has no impact on human behavior, but Horacio was about to find something different. We'll get to what he did and what he learned in just a minute, but first we're going to take a quick break. 
This is the first time we've taken a break in the middle of our story, but I have a few things to tell you. We're working on a special episode where you can ask your burning questions about anything related to human evolution, and I will find a scientist to answer it. I need you to call our voicemail line or leave a message on our new voicemail page. I'd also love some questions from kids, so don't be shy. Call our voicemail line at 707-788-8582 and leave your question. Or go to speakpipe.com slash origin stories and leave a message. Or record a voice memo on your phone and email it to us at originstories at leakyfoundation.org. Now I'm excited to introduce you to another show I think you'll really like. Hi, podcast listener. I'm Charlie J. Danders. And I'm Annalee Newitz. We're the hosts of Our Opinions Are Correct, a podcast about science fiction, science, and everything else. Every other week, we dissect a different topic. On recent episodes, we've talked about Star Wars, indigenous futurism, and the death of the universe. We care about this stuff because we write about it every day. I'm a science fiction writer who thinks a lot about science. And I'm a science journalist who writes science fiction. Together, we befriend cosmic monsters. So subscribe to Our Opinions Are Correct on Apple Podcasts and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Now back to our story about sleep and the moon. So after hearing about what people were up to on moonlit nights, Horacio and his team wanted to see if there was something to these stories, something they could measure. They wanted to find an answer to the question, does the moon cycle impact human sleep? Their hypothesis was that it does, and they predicted that they would find that people living without electricity sleep less under the bright light of a full moon. To find the answer, they tried a new approach to collecting their data. They use special accelerometers you wear on your wrist like a watch. So it's kind of like a Fitbit, but with more clinical precision, if you want. And from that, you can draw the timing of sleep with, you know, very high accuracy. They asked the study participants to wear the watch for at least one whole lunar month to capture every part of the moon cycle. It's a very simple way of studying sleep. All you have to do is wear a watch, and then we go there You know, every couple of weeks, download the data. And they also fill out sleep diaries, essentially to tell us if there was something peculiar about a night that maybe they traveled to another community, and therefore we can discard that night. That's, that's the essence of, of what we did differently than other studies. It, it's not, technically it's not uh, sophisticated, but it is logistically, you know, relatively difficult because you need to have access to communities like this and then be able to record for at least one month, sometimes up to two months, uh, because the, the lunar month is on average, you know, 29 and a half days or 30 days. So after they collected all the sleep data, they began to analyze it to see if it supported their hypothesis that people would be more awake on the night of the full moon, and to see if they could find patterns where sleep changed across the lunar cycle. I have to say there were some uh, good surprises, right? One was that we had predicted that the shorter sleep would be on the nights of full moon and maybe a few nights before and a few nights after and that's actually not what we found. And, and in fact, the initial analysis we did was, which is what everybody had done in other studies similar to ours, was to compare the nights of a full moon and maybe three nights before and three nights after versus the nights of new moon, three nights plus three minus, three nights minus. And we saw a small difference, but it was kind of, moderate and not super excited. I mean, it was in the right direction. And we were, we kind of knew that we we're doing something right, but it wasn't like a striking difference. And then one day, his collaborator, Leandro, decided to look at every single night throughout the moon cycle and plot all the data. And then that's when we saw that the trough of, of sleep duration, the shortest sleep durations were on the nights leading to full moon. And I was like, wow, what's you know, it, we just couldn't explain it for a while because, you know, we, we we kept saying, well, if it is about moonlight, we know that the brightest moonlight is during the full moon. So that should be the peak. And then, you know, a little bit after and a little bit before, it's still very bright, but it, it sort of decreases. 
The moon rises and sets in a predictable pattern throughout the lunar cycle, and one thing that happens is that in the nights leading up to the full moon, the brightest moonlight happens earlier in the evening. After the full moon, as the moon is waning, that bright light happens much later in the night, after people are typically already asleep. That's when we said, oh, this makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you're living under very natural conditions where you have no access to electricity whatsoever, after full moon, by the time the moon rises, you're already fast asleep, right? And you won't see that moon, right? Whereas on the, on the nights before the full moon, when you're about to go to bed, suddenly you have you shining a light on you and you say, well, I might as well take advantage of this, right? So I mean, at least that's how we explain it. And then they found something else they didn't expect. Something that wasn't easy to explain. They found that the pattern of sleeplessness on the nights leading up to the full moon was the same across all three study communities. The one with no electricity, the one with some electricity, and the one with streetlights and 24-7 access to electricity. They all had clear lunar rhythms to their sleep. And that was kind of a surprise because we thought, well, if you if you don't need moonlight for your life, right, for, for your activity at night, why should you care much about the moon cycle? So that's when we decided to go back to some of our data uh, from college students in the Seattle area, which we had been gathering for the last five years. Every time that I teach a class or other colleagues teach a class, we do this sleep lab in which students will record their own sleep for two weeks. And of course, two weeks is not enough to pick up the cycling one individual, but we had like 500 students from which we had recorded two weeks. And by chance, right, those two weeks fell over all windows of the lunar cycle. So they analyzed that data to see if they'd find the same thing they saw in the Tobaquam communities. And it was exactly the same, with the very same um, shortening of sleep and later sleep onset on the nights leading to full moon. Horacio's team published their findings in the journal Science Advances in January 2021. Their study showed that both the duration of sleep and the onset of sleep showed a clear pattern throughout the lunar cycle. People stayed up later and slept for shorter amounts of time on the three to five nights leading up to the night of the full moon. They slept between 20 and 90 minutes less on those nights and stayed up 30 to 80 minutes later than usual. This pattern didn't vary. It was the same in all of the study communities in Argentina and among the students in urban Seattle. And it's worth noting that even a change of a half hour in the duration and timing of your sleep can have a big impact on your health and brain function. But Horacio and Leandro and their colleagues don't know exactly why this happens why our sleep is in sync with the cycles of the moon. So now we're interested in knowing, well, is this delay that we see on sleep start and and the shortening of duration that we see on the nights leading to full moon, is it really a change in the circadian clock or is it just that people suddenly feel more awake for whatever reason, right, because Uh, somehow the moon is acting on other sleep centers, not necessarily their biological clock. So there's two alternative hypotheses, if you want. Um, And now we'd like to to test that both in Tobacuam communities and in in highly urbanized communities like in Seattle, where we also found these lunar rhythms, which is the second surprise that, that we found in this study that we have never dreamed or thought about obviously. And that's why we started going, you know, to the middle of nowhere in Argentina <laughs> to study these communities. We never thought we'd see lunar cycles uh, in a place like Seattle. Because in an urban environment, a lot of people aren't even aware of what the moon is doing. Not only they're not aware, but also the light pollution is actually above the levels that you'd perceive of moonlight during a full moon, for instance, right? So and that's that's a, an extremely perplexing finding because it suggests that our organism is sensitive to other changes related to the moon cycle and not necessarily the moonlight itself. And we know that with the lunar month, there's also a change 
on how intense the gravitational pull of the moon is on the surface of Earth. Um, you probably heard about spring tides, which are these every 15 days, the tides become higher. And that's typically during the new moon and during the full moon. And what we think is that our perception of the gravitational pull closer to the full moon makes us particularly sensitive to either moonlight or artificial light. And that's in turn what leads to this change in sleep time and only in the nights that are leading to full moon. There's still so much to learn about human biology and perception and circadian rhythms. Maybe humans on the moon are more connected and connected in different ways than we ever imagined. But there's clearly evidence that there's something beyond moonlight at play. Initially, we started with this idea that the sleep inhibition by specific moon phases was probably a response to the moonlight itself. Now that we're finding this in basically every community that we study, we've changed our hypothesis and we think that it's probably a combination of the gravitational influence of the moon, right? And in natural environments, your exposure to moonlight, in artificial environments, your exposure to artificial light. If that's the case, it, it probably means that throughout evolution, it was highly adapted to be to, to go to bed later on those nights in which it had moonlight at the beginning of the light. So much so that that influence of the moonlight and the moon cycle may have selected for biological traits that essentially makes us very sensitive to be awake on those nights, right? And to the point that even if you're living in an environment where you think you're fully isolated, you know, a completely built environment where you can control as much as you want your artificial light dark cycle, you're still under that influence. The fact that you can't escape the influence of the moon on your sleep no matter how hard you try, even if you live with 24-hour electricity and lots of light pollution, suggests that this is part of our biology, our evolutionary heritage as living animals. If you think about it, to me, it makes a lot of sense. Imagine if you were a hunter-gatherer, right, particularly in winter months, and suddenly you were living in Seattle. You know, in the winter here, the nights, it's pitch dark at 5 p.m., right, at most, and if it's cloudy, it's even earlier. Well, if you suddenly got an extra couple of hours because you had this natural source of light that extended your evening two or three hours, I think it makes perfect sense that you'd take full advantage of, uh, of that extra time. In a way, the effect of artificial light, which is very clear, it shortens our sleep, it delays our sleep onset, is essentially emulating what the moonlight was doing to our ancestors, right? And, and it's very hard not to be highly stimulated by that evening light. And what we think is that there are biological mechanisms that have been selected for that. Knowing more about the evolution of sleep and the biological rhythms that regulate sleep is important for lots of reasons. First of all, it may help us understand what were the, the environmental selective pressures were when we lived in, in non-built environments, right? When we're really exposed to all the natural cycles, but also because it may help us understand how we live now, right? And the clear example is what we found in, in students living in Seattle, that they have very clear lunar rhythms, and we are totally unaware of how these natural cycles can still influence our sleep and our circadian rhythms in general, right? And we like to think that as, as humans that we have managed to isolate ourselves from nature and control very accurately our built environment to the point that the natural cycles will not affect us, but that's clearly not the case, right? And I think understanding how these inescapable cycles were exposed to modified basic physiological processes like sleep 
is fundamental, not just to, to understand yourself, but all, as a human being, but also from a health care perspective. We know now that sleep problems, sleep deprivation is, is a big epidemic, right, in most urbanized environments, right? And understanding more about how sleep is regulated may help us address that. Because sleep is so central to our lives and insomnia has serious health consequences, knowing that there's an evolutionary reason why it's harder to fall asleep on moonlit nights can actually make a difference in the way you sleep. And, and that's, you know, really amazing because if you think about, for instance, different types of insomnia that we suffer, right? A very typical one is what we call sleep onset insomnia. People with sleep onset insomnia are people that cannot fall asleep when they go to bed, right? Other people have insomnia that they wake up in the middle of the night. But sometimes people struggle for one hour trying to fall asleep at the beginning of the night, right? And that's very stressful not to be able to fall asleep. And the effect that we're finding is sometimes of an hour, right? So maybe knowing that you are in that sensitive phase pre-full moons would be a great thing to know for your own body so that you can be more prepared to either not fall asleep or to be a little more proactive on those nights to say not you know get exposed to bright screens at the end of those nights or to bright light or to you know very exciting social media whatever whatever it is that keeps you awake at the end of the day um maybe those nights you have to be particularly careful about avoiding those stimuli Many thanks to Dr. Horacio de la Iglesia for sharing his work. You can learn more about his research on his website. The link is in the show notes. And you should absolutely check it out to see more about this work and other research on homelessness and sleep, nocturnal owl monkeys, and more. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to funding human origins research and sharing discoveries. You can support this show and the science we talk about by making a donation to the Leaky Foundation today. All donations towards the podcast will be quadruple matched. We're trying to raise $1,500 to meet a quadruple matching challenge from Jeannie Newman and the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation. Every dollar you give to support the show will be multiplied times four. Visit leakyfoundation.org slash donate and leave a note in the notes section to let us know that your donation is for the podcast. I want to especially thank Dr. Diana McSherry and Pat Poe for sponsoring today's episode of Origin Stories. We really appreciate their support of the Leaky Foundation and our educational programs. This episode was produced by me, Meredith Johnson. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Theme music by Henry Nagel. Additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Lee Rosevear. We'll be back next month with a brand new episode. As always, thanks for listening. <laughs>